Um, hi everyone and welcome. Uh, I'm Octavia Stocker and I'm an editor at Juxta Press. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this digital discussion. Thank you for tuning in to How to Be an Activist and a Writer. Thank you especially to our speakers, Andrew Ross, Chloe Regis, Astra Taylor and Gigi Ruggiero for joining us. This event is both inspired by and in honor of a pamphlet by Andrew Ross called Under Conditions Not of Our Choosing, which Juxta published in November as part of our series on Thoughts One Can't Do Without. One of the central questions that Andrew Ross's essay addresses is the compatibility of creative endeavor with political effort and the necessity of combining theory with practice. I'd also like to quickly add that this event is part of Printed Matters Virtual Art Book Fair, which is running until Sunday, and it's packed full of events and readings from international publishers. So please, um, yeah, it's well worth checking out. Um, after a discussion, there will be a Q&A. So feel free to write your questions into the little box and do say so if it's directed towards the particular speaker. Um, <coughs> I now have the great pleasure of introducing Andrew Ross, a professor of social and cultural analysis and director of the American Studies Program at NYU, a contributor to The Guardian, The New York Times, The Nation, Art Forum and Al Jazeera. He is the author or editor of more than 20 books, including Creditocracy and the Case for Debt Refusal, and most recently, Stone Men, The Palestinians Who Built Israel, which won the Palestine Book Award. Chloe Regis is a Mexican writer based in London. She is the author of three novels, Book of Clouds, which won the Prix de Premier Roman Étrangère in France, Asunder, set in London's National Gallery, and Sea Monsters, which was awarded the 2020 Penn Faulkner for fiction. Chloe has written for various art journals and was guest curator of the Leonora Carrington exhibition at Tate Liverpool. Chloe is a member of Extinction Rebellion's Writers Rebel, a group of writers who focus on addressing the climate emergency. Juxta Press is lucky enough to be publishing a short book by Chloe on the Mexican painter Nawi Olin later this year as part of our Words for Portraits series. Astra Taylor is a co-founder of the Debt Collective and the director of the documentary films What is Democracy, Zizak, and Examined Life, among others. She has written for the New York Times, the LA Times, the Baffler, N Plus One, and other outlets. She is the author of the American Book Award winner, The People's Platform, Taking Back Power and Culture in the Digital Age, and Democracy may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. Gigi Ruggiero is a researcher, teacher, and militant publicist. He is part of the editorial boards of the journals Machina and Commonware. He has written books, essays, and articles, some translated into several languages, on the transformations of subjectivity, work, and education industry. I highly recommend his book, The Production of Living Knowledge, which examines the university system as a key site of conflict and transformation. So I'd like to start um, the first question, simply how to be an activist and a writer? How do you start combining activism with creative work? And what are the paradoxes or tensions in working as both an activist and a writer? And Andrew, I was wondering if you might be able to answer this question first, how, how did you become an activist and a writer? Yeah, thanks so much, Octavia, for, uh, for bringing us together uh, for this event, first of all. And uh, let me just say that I think that, you know, trying to be a writer and an activist at the same time is really bloody hard. <laughs> uh, it's much easier being an activist than a propagandist. And, and by that, I don't mean to suggest that making propaganda is an inferior art because every movement or cause needs good propaganda and skilled people to do it. Um, but I think for most of us, being a writer entails some independence of mind. And it's that freedom to pursue thoughts and ideas at will 
that is sometimes at odds with what activism actually needs, you know, which is usually about staying on message, skillfully communicating agreed upon principles and arguments and so on and so forth. So the challenge, at least as I've experienced it, is, is in trying to reconcile these two often competing obligations. The first one to make yourself useful to a cause and your comrades. The second one is to follow your own intellectual instincts by pushing a topic or a problem further along the road than the current agreed upon messaging allows. And I guess I first encountered this challenge uh, when I got involved in the labor movement in the early 1990s, specifically the anti-sweatshop movement. I remember giving a speech at a, a, a garment a worker rally. And, uh, and after the event, a trade unionist official took me aside and, and suggested that uh, um, perhaps I should have re reserved some of my comments for another occasion. Clearly, uh, I hadn't learned the discipline of uh, required of trade unionists or even of scholars upon, upon whom you know, the labor movement relies. And I think, uh, as I recall, this, this gentle chiding continued when I started writing more widely for the movement. And then uh, more so when uh, my labor activism moved into the academic workplace to support students and, and colleagues who were organizing into unions of their own. That pressure I found, uh, however, to be a little less noticeable, but not entirely absent um, in other activist groups to which I've committed my energies over the years, especially those involving artists, you know, who are trained to be undisciplined in a way. And, and here I would mention two movement groups that, that I co-founded, the, the Gulf Artists Labor Coalition and Decolonize This Place, both of which are largely artist-centered. Um, this was also the case with Occupy Wall Street, which is where I met Gigi and Astra. Um, and that was a great upheaval in my life, uh, not, not meeting them, but <laughs> Occupy. <laughs> And uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, I was one of the people that fell in love with Occupy. And um, uh, Occupy allowed me or gave me permission to devote much more of my life to activism, you know, while keeping my day job. And that led to commit me to commit to a series of uh, projects and campaigns that became key to the debt resistance movement, what we call the debt resistance movement those included the Occupy Student Debt Campaign, Strike Debt, Rolling Jubilee, and, and the Debt Collective, the most recent incarnation of our energies. And Astra and I are both co-founders and organizers within the Debt Collective. I, I'd say that within each of these groups, you know, we created our own sense of discipline and accountability to the cause, but I also tried to retain some independence as a writer and analyst within them, because ultimately, uh, I think every movement of action needs a movement of ideas. And the trick again is to try to, uh, to synchronize these two, because for activists, everything needs to be done today. It's that kind of temporality. It's a very urgent temporality. And for writers, you know, the germination of ideas and thoughts is on a much slower temporal cycle. So we, ha we have to learn how to synchronize these two. Last thing I'd say is, and here I'm speaking as a scholar, uh, the shift of my energies towards activism has meant uh, moving away from what I think of as advocacy research, which is what most left-leaning academics do towards uh, militant research, which is uh, where you're an integral part of a movement and the movement requires research in order to further its, its goals. And as a militant researcher, I still get chided on occasion by comrades, but I'm much more comfortable with it now. And that's a big difference. Thank you, Octavia. I think yeah, uh, movement of action, movement action is really yeah, it's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, 
Um, I think, Chloe, in Writers Rebel, you're actually in a community of activist writers. Yeah. And most people in the organization are also, or maybe, first of all, writers. But how, how do you find navigating those two roles? Well, I'm continually impressed. There's people in the group who speak about strategy and mapping things out and what Andrew was saying about messaging. And I, and, um, I hadn't thought about it until just now when you're speaking, but I realized that's one of the, the disconnects I have sometimes in our, our weekly meetings is that um, my, of course, with my, and especially with my fiction and the way my whole process of writing, it's very meandering and the opposite of, um, I mean, I don't have anything mapped out when I set out to write. And so the thought of having every sentence somehow already um, having its aim and its targeted audience and um, desired effect, some, it's so anathema to anything I'm used to. So in our meeting, um, I'd say most of the people in it are a bit more immediate goal oriented than I am. And so our discussions, um, I come up with ideas, but they're much better at finding structure and um, sort of a feel for them. But um, until this, this, until joining Writers Rebel, when it was found, well, I, I, I guess I sort of helped found it with um, Liz Jensen and Monique Rafi and James Miller in early 2000, in early autumn 2019, in our first event, uh, David Graver spoke at it. Um, and we had, we had our, a marathon during one of the Extinction, Extinction Rebellion uprisings, um, 40 writers in Trafalgar Square and an hour before um, the police had confiscated our sound system and our stage. And so it was like everything else um, during the rebellion, it's all very ad hoc. And, and then it poured cats and dogs halfway through and Simon Shaw almost got electrocuted by his microphone. It was just one of those, but it felt very much like, um, it really felt, it felt like the most authentic literary event I'd ever attended in a way. <laughs> And it was just, it was wonderful. And it was spontaneous and everyone was speaking from somewhere else than they would at a literary festival. And, um, but until joining Writers Rebel, I'd, I'd, I'd had for so many years this pent up frustration of how to channel um, all my, well, concern is an understatement, but all my nightmares and anguish about the climate crisis and species extinction. And, um, and I was just tired of, signing petitions or giving very, very modest, you know, amounts of money to the organization, to Sea Shepherd or Animals Asia or um, the, the organizations that I, I, I support so strongly. But it, I had, I grew up with a model at home, which is my father's a Mexican poet and environmentalist. And well, he became an environmentalist in 1985 on, an ex, on a heavily polluted day in Mexico City um, he rang up a, a friend of his who was a, a philosopher named Ramon Chirao, and they just that day collected a hundred signatures from different writers and artists, and 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 so they were quickly called the Group of One Hundred by a journalist, and demanding that the the government release uh, pollution figures, and then they quickly evolved into a group, and um, three of their most important campaigns involved um, defending uh, and victories uh, at the time for. Um, three migratory species, the monarch butterfly, the gray whale, and the sea turtle all come to Mexico at different times of year. Um, but anyway, so I grew up with that model at home of just seeing my father who was a writer and then, and, and my mother helped enormously too and became the international coordinator and it grew and grew, um, the group of 100. So I grew up with that model at home, but I, and then I met someone formidable named Petra Kelly, who was the co-founder of the German Green Party. And, she, and so I grew up with, you know, surrounded by um, this sort of, well, idealism is the wrong word because there's also, a, you know, a, a heavy sense of, of reality that sort of uh, anchors the too much idealism. But I, but anyway, until Writers Rebel, I didn't, I was so happy to finally have a community and to actually, and, and last autumn, I'll finish soon, but um, I, we organized an event called On the Brink about, uh, and we invited writers and wildlife activists to choose a species and speak about it for five minutes and um, about critically endangered species. But, but I did find during the pandemic, there was also this release of tension that activism 
provided and also a sense of community and then obviously doing more zoom events so somehow people across the world are accessible for anything you want to organize and so but anyway so i feel like it was just in the past year and a half that something unlike probably all of you but something for me solidified a lot and cemented itself in terms of activism yeah so it's, i mean it sounds like it just added a lot to your to your life as a writer it's kind of amazing. yeah and at the moment they're still sort of parallel they don't spill too much into each other but um and astra as someone who's like a, a writer a director and an activist i was wondering what are some of the creative tensions that you've kind of experienced in those in those roles yeah i I mean, I feel like this is a constant live issue juggling these different tensions. And I, I kind of feel like I'm in a moment where <laughs> I want a change. I want a, a rebalancing actually in my own life. Um, I mean, activism and writing for me, not to be a bit twee, but for me, they just go back to the very beginning. Like I was literally 10 or 11 years old and I started a magazine for which I was organizing other kids to write about animal rights and environmental justice issues. And my mission was to organize a kid rebellion against these lying adults who were destroying the natural, natural world. Um, and so one of my great activist disappointments, and it was really a kind of traumatic, was that a lot of kids didn't agree with me. Like they didn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't they didn't want to rebel against the grown-ups and, and they weren't ready to stop eating chicken nuggets and all of these things that I thought we should do. And, and they also didn't really want to write articles with me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had very few friends as a result of this enterprise. Um, and so I That's suppose true. one uh happy revelation as a as an adult is that actually organizing and writing has brought me a community. I have found my people through this and it's 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 made me you know, far less lonely, um, I think, as, as we respond to this grief that we feel in the world when we see all of the injustice and everything that's happening. So, um, so I'm happy that, you know, that's, that's one benefit of it. But, you know, to, I want there, you know, I think Andrew said something that, that feels quite true, which is this, this, I want to be in service of building power. And my writing is one tool in that. <laughs> it can be one useful tool. Um, you know, I, I think for me, uh, you know, I, I almost had this sort of angry ethos, right? Like, I don't want to be someone who's just a writer and who only talks about stuff and is like all theory and not really doing the work, right? Um, and so I, I want to engage with this question, how do you actually build power? You know, it's one thing to analyze an economic system, but how do you actually build the, the social power to change it? How do you build the economic power? And that's what the debt collective is trying to do. We're trying to build debtor power to do that. But definitely there's part of me that wants my autonomy and, and wants my, um, you know, cr create creative space, but also my space to be curious and to learn. So the problem with propagandizing, I mean, propagandizing can be creative. You know, how do you make something beautiful? How do you make something propagate out in the world? How do you make something that people want to share and spread? But it can be a little bit like telling people what you already know and what you think they should do instead of that that sense of you know, what I would call my my more creative writing or filmmaking, which is where I'm really I am genuinely curious. That's the motivation. I want to learn something. And then if I package what I've learned and make it into something I share, well, that's that's a wonder. That's sort of the goal of it. But it's really it's not about this sort of prescriptive you know, instructive mode of engaging. And so I, I really, it's very important to me that I keep that sort of creative, curious space alive for myself. Because if I'm only in that reactive, I think the temporality is really true. Organizing is like reactive. It's not contempt, contemplative, right? Uh, I just feel diminished as a human being. <laughs> so I really have to keep those, those two spaces going. Um, you know, but for me, yeah, the motivation I guess is I think the things that motivate me are, you know, curiosity, wanting to keep learning and justice. And the medium, I'm kind of agnostic. Like sometimes the medium's an essay, sometimes the medium's a book, and sometimes the medium is an organization. And as Andrew said, we've had a lot of different iterations as we've tried to find the right form uh, for this, this debtor organizing. Um, you know, and when it's working, they all complement each other and, and, and they feel like there's a kind of synergy there and then sometimes like in moments now like now i just feel like actually you know the activism side of my equation is too high and i want to get i want to cultivate 
a bit more of the um, artistic space. And so I think that that's why the question is actually a little triggering for me or provocative right now, because I feel like I'm a little out of whack personally. And it's partly this pandemic, right? It's that I feel that sense of responding to this emergency. I feel that there's a sense of opportunity right now for in what we're doing. So the Debt Collective is organizing a strike. We have a window where there's a new admin administration in the US. So maybe we can seize this moment, strike while the iron's hot. Um, uh, but, uh, and so, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to fritter that away with your head in the clouds or whatever. Um, the last thing I'll say though, is I do have a reaction against the sort of any distinction between theory and practice as though they're too divided, like on some level they are, but I think, you know, practice informs theory, uh, like action in informs your thinking ideas come from the experimentation of being an activist. Right. And so that is, they're not divided for me, this you know, I've learned so much from trying to be an activist and an organizer and kind of you see that, you know, your map from on high that you have, like, for example, with debtor organizing, you can read a whole lot about financialization and neoliberalism and how debt has become dominant in, in late capitalism. But there's nothing like trying to actually organize people and following those chains of debt from the bottom up going from people and then trying to understand the crisis from that perspective. And that is learning that is theorizing that is thinking. And, um, and it really, I think, gets devalued too often. Yeah, I'm definitely hoping that's something I think that will be talked about a lot today and we'll learn is how theory and practice should and can be really closely entwined. Um, and Gigi, uh, do you think of yourself primarily as an activist or a writer? Did one come before the other? What was your... Okay, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, the invitation for uh, this um, occasion of uh, discussion. I think that uh, the matter that, uh, and sorry for my broke, very broken, uh, broken English, uh, I think that uh, the matter you, uh, you posed uh, and uh, the, 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 the matter of the, the, the Andrews book is uh, really crucial. How to combine theory and uh, practice, uh, and uh, I think in is right. There is, uh, let's say, not revolutionary uh, practice without uh, revolutionary theory and uh, vice versa. Um, at the same time, I think it, it, uh, it is quite difficult to answer to the question of the title of the, of the talk, because uh, first of all, we have uh, to understand what an activist is and what a writer is. Let's say I, I try to be active and I try to be to write, uh, but I must confess uh, I will des define myself as uh, neither an activist uh, and neither a writer. Uh, I prefer the definition of, of militant. Uh, I, I know that uh, in the American and the Anglo Saxon context, the word mil militant is. Uh, little used uh, or uh, is reserved for small, fairly marginal <laughs> or sectarian uh, groups. Um, here, in, uh, here in Italy, uh, we understand uh, an activist, uh, historically, we, un we understand an activist uh, as someone who mobilizes, uh, who is active for a specific cause. Often when the cause is over, the activist is over. Activism is therefore one of the many characteristics or activities that identify a subject. Traditionally, the term activist was linked uh, to uh, vol voluntary uh, organization. Uh, the militant is uh, different. To be very brief and uh, to, put, to put it in a very stenographic way, I, I would define uh, the militant as one who puts his life entirely uh, on the line. Not one of the characteristic of the subject's life, but the subject's life itself. Uh, from this point of view, the problem is not uh, to link uh, the role of the militant with the role of the writer, but uh, to be a militant who writes. Um, on the side of being a writer, uh, I think I, also we must uh, confront uh, with the crisis of the classic figure of the intellectual, the figure that, uh, let's say, emerge uh, from the, uh, sorry, uh, 
the, the figure that uh, uh, emerged from the Enlightenment onwards. Uh, for a long time in the 20th century, knowledge and uh, culture on one, on one end and the production and politics on the other uh, end were seen as uh, two separate spheres, two separate worlds. Uh, the, intellectual, the intellectual was therefore engaged in the cultural battle, while the militant was engaged in the political battle and the battle of production relations. Think, for example, of uh, Gramsci's uh, concept of uh, uh, organic intellectual. Uh, think uh, of uh, uh, Althusser's uh, distinction between theoretical, theoretical practice and political uh, uh, practice. Uh, this uh, separation, I think, has long been uh, in crisis. Culture and knowledge are entirely within the relations of production. Thus, the intellectual uh, is uh, quite a proletarianized figure. The, uh, the, the, the intellectual is a, a worker of an and in an industry, uh, the culture industry, uh, or the education industry, or uh, the communication industry, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, a militant who, who does not write, a militant who does not think, a militant who does not uh, do research is uh, simply not uh, a militant. Uh, since the 60s, uh, th there has been a practice linked to Italian political operaismo, and in particular to a specific figure, Romano Alquati, that is called co-research, co-research. Uh, that is to say, um, a, a research done together by militants and workers. Not in the sense that uh, militants and workers uh, were the same thing or lived the same condition. It wasn't like that. But because uh, in common, they produced both knowledge and organization, research and new subjectivity. Uh, let's say uh, co-research, uh, it is a process of transformation of what is a big research and who is doing the research. So maybe a first approximation um, answer to your question is, uh, through a core research uh, practice. I think this is the combination of uh, theory and, practi and practice. Thank you. Yeah, I love, I love the idea that actually the answer to how to be an activist and writer is just to be, be a militant. That's, yeah, I kind of want to rename the event retrospective militants. I really like that. Um, the next question I want to ask is, um, is to, Astra, and it actually relates to something you you were saying earlier when you talked about your documentaries being more um, contemplative. That you you go out and and when you're curious about something, that's when you make a documentary. Um, I have an examined life and what is democracy. They both they're both formed around dialogues and encounters, rather than an effort to persuade or convince. And I was wondering why you kind of chose the formal approach of the of the dialogue of the encounter. Um, I like. I mean, I like good conversation. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. Um, I don't. You know, I think there's a kind of didactic propagandistic, I mean, I like propaganda, so I'm kind of using this in a negative way, but there's a kind of me um, media that I just find tiresome. I suppose I want to I want to address my audience in a way that I feel I would respond to and, and enjoy being addressed. Um, and so how do you create space for the, my, I, a guiding question for me is how do you create space for the audience, the viewer to have their own thoughts and their own reflections about things? Um, you know, and when I say I'm curious about things like the curiosity that drives me to these projects, it's not just about the content. So what is democracy is about democracy. I'm curious about political theory, but I'm also, you know, what can I do with film, right? Like how can I push the medium of, demo of documentary to be a more philosophical intellectual medium, right? Instead of uh, just say it, just telling human interest stories, right? We're used to documentaries that take one character and you follow that person and maybe they have a hero's arc or tragedy or something. It's like, well, how do you put ideas at the center? How do you make ideas the star of your film? How do you um, make a collective narrative? And so these are, these are the sorts of things. Um, what, you know, so what is democracy as a dialogue? Partly because um, 
So dialogue isn't just speaking. So it is about the people on screen speaking, but it's also about listening and being receptive. So I really thought a lot about the politics of listening as I was making that film. There's a lot of shots of me really listening intently. There's a lot of that back and forth. Um, so it's, I don't know, the film for me is kind of a statement about the that exchange that you have. And it's actually really an exchange that's central to organizing. If you talk to a really good organizer, you talk to a labor organizer like Jane McAlevey, she'll say, a good organizer listens first. They say, what's going on here at your workplace? What's going on in your community? And you listen. <laughs> and so in that film, I'm playing with uh, this question of like, who's an intellectual? So like, what if an intellectual is actually someone who asks questions and listens a lot, not someone who just pontificates and knows, right? Um, so that's one thing I'm really, and I, you know, and for me, that's an organizer isn't someone who tells you what to do. It's someone who listens to you and, and maybe gives you space to actually come up with ideas yourself about maybe, you know, what's best for your community. Um, so I'm working through all this stuff in these different mediums that all is related, but it just comes through in different ways, depending on what, what the form is that I'm engaged with at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, uh, kind of everyone watching has seen Astrid films, but if you haven't, please go and watch them. I, they're amazing. And Astrid's book, um, Democracy May Not Exist, but almost a, when it's gone, is a companion to what is democracy. You often do companion books to your, to your films, and they're just wonderful to read alongside. I really, I really recommend it. Um, and then... I was going to actually um, ask Chloe a little bit more um, about how your, your work in climate emergency and on ecology factors into, into your practice as a writer and that your writing encompasses not just human concerns but also urban ecosystems in a way that feels deeply embedded in the narrative, narrative structure. And yeah, I'm interested in, in what draws you to give so much space to the non-human in these very human cities. Mm -hmm. um, and also how, how, you, how you go about that. Well, I guess um, animal rights and animal welfare are, have been um, what I care, have cared most deeply about since I was probably 12, since the age of 12 or so. So again, even in, um, in the first novel and the second, um, in more subtle ways, there's, I always, well, I believe quite strongly in the urban contract we have with urban fauna. So for instance, pigeons or in Mexico, stray dogs. Um, I wrote a piece last year about the stray dogs in Mexico, well, all over Mexico, because my my editors upon handing in my, the last novel said there were you know, 37 mentions of dogs in the book and I had to remove some of them. And I said, but, in Mexico, in every landscape, there's a dog, whether it's city, beach, wherever, wherever you are, there's a stray dog within the, your field of vision. Um, and, and they embody, well, so many things from, the, you know, so many different um, types of inju injustice and also, um, and, and division, but also on a very, um, on a more sort of existential, well, physical level, of course, they they lead very brief, um, unhappy lives, most of them. And Mexico is more stray dogs than anywhere in Latin America. But anyway, but I do I so even though the three novels I've written so far, they they're um, quite sort of introspective, um, sort of portraiture of the whatever narrator there is. But but I've always been very aware of the urban fauna and that is implicated in every human story, even if they're unmentioned sometimes. But in the, in the novel I'm finishing now, there's, um, there's more about bats. And then um, I become very interested in, in a group here called the Hunt Saboteurs. Some of you may be familiar with them, but I think they've been around since the 60s and they intervene, so it's direct action and they intervene and try to sabotage the hunt, the fox hunt, but they also they also intervene on behalf of you know, badgers and other wildlife, but and grouse shoots and all these abominations that still go on here. But um, but again, there's just so many um, so many class issues also involved in, in well, especially the hunt saboteurs. But um, so it's with the fiction. I've just I've I find it increasingly difficult to 
separate to keep the two separate and um but i'm also quite wary of setting out to yeah i to, i'm quite wary of, of becoming didactic any any way or letting the fiction be ruled by a governing idea unless it comes very naturally and so with writers rebel we discussed from early on um we said well so far i'm one of the few who hasn't written about the climate emergency in my fiction and we said well the most important thing is just to discuss it in every platform you have and you know be an activist that way and and what Gigi was saying earlier about militancy it's, it's something that made me think about how before every action of ours we discuss which one of us is willing to be arrested and how far some of us be willing to take it and you know Extinction Rebellion is all about disruption but um there's so many writers who are just say oh no I have a wife and children or a university job I can't be arrested and some of us in the group are willing to go a bit further and spend a few nights in jail. It's difficult because I'm one, I'm the only one I think who's in the group is non, who's not British, even though I'm a citizen now, but I still have that slight fear of, of being arrested. And, but anyway, but I think a lot or constantly about the issue of militancy and how far are you willing to go? And, and um, I could imagine my, and Sea Shepherd or um, the Hunt Saboteurs and just intervening on behalf of an animal that's in front of you and trying to save its life that I could imagine doing and getting arrested for that. Uh, yeah. um, it's interesting you say that you, do, you don't touch on the climate emergency that much in your novels because I have this very vivid image from your recent novel Sea Monster when in Mexico uh, you describe pigeons or, or birds falling from the sky. I think Not a very polluted day. On the yeah. 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 And, and, and those are ominous yeah, signs of that, yeah. Which now you read as, you know, the start of the, uh, yeah. the climate emergency. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and stray dogs are an earthquake and all, all this, yeah. yeah. It's true. I think not on a conscious level, but it's all maybe there already, which is nice to know, yeah. It's a wonderful novel. Um, and then um, if I come, come back to you, Andrew, um, that in one of your sections in Under Conditions Not of Our Choosing, which I will hold up again, um, you write that solidarity, at least in its most useful form, has to be earned. And you're talking I, about how you, you often write from within, within movements. Why do you find solidarity or how does solidarity kind of like work within your writing? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I guess I want to think about that distinction I made earlier between advocacy writing and militant writing. And thank you, Gigi, for profile and give us, giving us a higher profile for the militant. Um, I think polit you know politically engaged writers uh, are in a position because they have access to publicity. They, they're in a position to to amplify the voices of, of people or communities that uh, who, who don't enjoy that level of access. And so, you know, we can take up the cause, if you like, of the unheard and become committed, maybe even trusted advocates of their cause. But unless we have some skin in the game, you know, we're usually in the optional position of being able to walk away, you know, relatively unscathed. And so I would want to distinguish that kind of risk-free or optional advocacy from a, a much deeper and more durable involvement in a cause. And uh, you know, there's that well-known saying um, of Lila Watson, Aboriginal activist from Queensland, who said, uh, "If you've come here to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine." then let us work together. And I think that kind of warning or invitation, if you like, is uh, about parachuting in, is, is most often issued to you know, well-intentioned white saviors. And uh, it can sometimes have positive outcomes, you know, investigations of white privilege that aren't simply self-indulgent uh, and can lead to new kinds of relationships with those who are struggling for their rights and livelihoods. That's a relational model of organizing. Um, but, but the transformational spirit of what Watson is saying, I think applies to anyone who's doing political work or art. And it, it's worth you know, adopting as a general rule. 
So I, I think that question, um, uh, what does it mean to see your own liberation as bound up with that of others with whom you might not share a common background or experience? Thinking about that question is really the crux of true solidarity. And the outcome, well, the outcome doesn't always involve things like marching arm in arm, you know, in defiance of or in confrontation with the oppressor, which is the sort of familiar iconography of uh, solidarity. Oftentimes it means, and, and especially if you're white and male like me, it means that uh, uh, you step back. You're there, you're, you're solid, but you take a back seat uh, or else it means submerging your identity and status, whatever prestige you have, because that's not what's important. And, and especially in BIPOC centered movements. So, and this practice of being there, but stepping back goes totally against the grain of uh, the traditions of the politically in, engaged intellectual, you know, the sort of Jean-Paul Sartre type of all-purpose intellectual who lends their name and voice to a cause. Uh, so in that regard, I, I've come to learn that earning solidarity means, you know, completely breaking with that tradition of the all-purpose intellectual. The other aspect of it has to do maybe not so much with gender and race as with age. Most of the activists I work with are much younger than I am, and, and many of them have good reasons to fear that their future is already foreclosed, whether from crushing debt or environmental ruination or uh, the total surveillance. And uh, I think that movement groups benefit from being transgenerational, uh, but it also carries you know, some challenges, uh, especially for elders. You know, you, you have to learn how to bite your tongue when you see uh, decisions being made that you've seen being made an error at an earlier part of your activist life, for example. So I've come to believe that uh, being a radical for life, as opposed to one that simply ages in place, being a radical for life means that you, you never should stop listening to uh, young voices and ideas, never, ever. Uh, Muriel Rukeyser, the poet, once described young radicals as exiles from the future, which I really like that phrase. It's not a bad idea, um, perhaps, to think about older radicals as being exiles from their own past. Uh, I, I guess I could live with that because um, I think it helps us to prepare for meeting the challenge of uh, intervening politically in a timely fashion you know, without having the past weigh upon our brains like a nightmare, to paraphrase Marx. The last thing I would say is uh, just, just to go back to the business of writing. Uh, I, I don't regret for one minute that there continue to be armchair theorists who do very heavy lifting in the realm of ideas. They do important political work. Some of them are very good friends of mine. Uh, at a certain point, however, Although I had been trained as an armchair thinker myself, you know, as part of the so-called theory generation, I could no longer do that kind of writing while showing up every so often for protests and rallies. Um, I had to get more immersed in, in the work of organizing and direct action. And I really love direct action. I, I get a real sort of visceral and mental thrill out of direct action. Um, uh, and, and especially, I, I think we need to do that kind of organizing, especially in the era of social media, which has displaced so much of our in-person work. And, and the pandemic, of course, has magnified that. Um, but ultimately also because immersion in that kind of organizing has helped me find my own voice as a political writer. Uh, I, as an academic researcher, I'd already made the transition from armchair uh, research to what I call scholarly reporting and field work with communities, like meeting people face to face of where they are. But the activist work uh, also helped me find a political voice that, uh, that I'm more comfortable with. And for writers, it's very, it's very important to find that voice and to take that step for some folks, they find it very early in their career. 
Um, for others, you know, like myself, it took me a long time really to hit that stride and, and, and locate that voice, which I felt most comfortable with. Thank you. That was, yeah, that was really interesting. And um, I mean, obviously at Juxta, we're the fans of your writing. And I think we are going to, you know, send out a little link about the book to all the attendees afterwards. Um, and then Gigi, I want to ask you about in the future of living production, you focus on the corporatization of the university, which I think a lot of people might have this ideal of the university as a space where writing and activism go together quite naturally. Um, do you, I mean, do, do you think that is, that's possible? Or... Yes, I, sorry, I, I opened the link uh, uh, posted by uh, Astra and uh, I'll uh, surely see the, the film uh, with the, my favorite uh, actor, Andrew. <laughs> the, the, the film of uh, the, inter the Intercept. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll see the, uh, the movie after, after the talk. Um, yes, I, I, I remember also that, uh, Andrew, that uh, the, um, we, uh, we met the first time uh, uh, some years before uh, uh, Occupy uh, movement, uh, uh, during, uh, you remember, during the uh, GSOC uh, strike, the strike oh, yeah. of graduate students yeah, yeah. Uh, at uh, NYU in 2005, 2006. I think the, the, I, 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 I say this because it's uh, um, quite important for uh, the question posed by uh, Octavia. Uh, because the figure um, of uh, the academic uh, has changed. Uh, all, although uh, there is, uh, I have the impression that there is uh, not always much uh, perception of, uh, of, uh, of this change. Uh, obviously, there is, no, uh, there is not a single uh, figure. We cannot say that there is an you know, overall, let's say, <laughs> Uh, proletarianization uh, that uh, uh, affects uh, everyone. It is not uh, uh, like that. The, uh, there is a deep hierarchy uh, that uh, needs to be studied uh, and uh, investigated. Uh, what has certainly changed, however, is the role of the university. Uh, for some time uh, now, uh, it has been an industry. Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, we, 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 have, we, we had a project called Edu Factory that was uh, an international global uh, uh, network of uh, uh, dis discussion, but also intervention uh, within uh, uh, the university that focused exactly this concept of uh, the uh, education uh, uh, um, uh, factory. Uh, the point is that uh, a university uh, worker's uh, form of political mobilization cannot uh, only look uh, outside to the external world, but uh, one must first mobilize within and against uh, uh, the industry in which one is placed, within and against the edu factory. And the university is, is a strategic industry, is a strategic uh, factory for various uh, uh, reasons. Uh, I have uh, the impression that uh, um, an idea of, uh, let's say, uh, exceptionalism of the university uh, uh, still uh, prevails within uh, the university workers. That is to say, the university is not a workplace uh, like any other, and the university workers are not workers uh, like any other, or even not workers uh, at all. Let me give a, 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 an example. Uh, about uh, 10 years ago, there was uh, in Italy a mobilization of uh, university students and uh, researchers uh, against a government uh, reform uh, imposing uh, cuts uh, to the university uh, and further um, um, precarity. Uh, Andrew, maybe we remember uh, this because uh, uh, he was in uh, Bologna uh, in, uh, in, uh, in that period. Uh, um, during the mobilization, uh, many researchers said, 
we don't want to go on strike because we are not workers. Our job is not uh, a work, but it, but it is a mission. I replied, but uh, how do you pay the rent of your house uh, or uh, the shopping at the supermarket with the, the emission coin? Uh, uh, but this is a, a big note, a great uh, uh, problem. I, I think this is the problem of recognition. Uh, I can work for low wage uh, or uh, for free at the university because I have a mission. I am recognized by society as a figure belonging to the work, uh, world of culture, uh, to the world of uh, knowledge, to the intellectual world. Uh, it is a kind of um, psychological wage uh, that replace in part and sometimes entirely, uh, like my, I talk of Italy, but I think not only in Italy, uh, the real wage. And it leads uh, to uh, accepting everything. Uh, at the highest level of non precarious teachers, this recognition uh, as an intellectual leads uh, to the production of a very academic left wing subjectivity. In Italy, they are called barons or red barons, which then uh, uh, um, um, developed uh, uh, their uh, activism outside the university, in, uh, let's say, looking uh, to uh, uh, other uh, people. Uh, Chloe, uh, before uh, uh, um, say uh, many very important things, but uh, one was, was very right. Uh, but I think that uh, to be arrested is a problem also for uh, who is not a writer or for, for uh, who is not uh, in the university and also for who uh, has not uh, uh, children. Uh, uh, I, I think I, that, that this, uh, I think that this is that uh, this separation that we have to break to transform the university. Because in my opinion, the problem with the university is not, uh, not so much, is, is not only the academic freedom, the repression of what you say. As long as you don't touch the exploitative relation within the Edu Factory, in, the, in the, a lot of university, you can say more or less anything you want, as long as what you say is not practical consequences. So I think that this is real the problem, to break this separation. And I quoted uh, the GSOC strike as one of the concrete practical, practical example of uh, breaking this uh, separation. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, definitely not just a problem in Italy, but here, here in the UK too, the psychological wage. Um, I think now it's time to turn to if we have some questions from the attendees, audience. There's one from Jesse Herring, um, and I think it's just to, to everyone. Um, how can artist writers who do not have access to the oxygen of publicity balance the daily demands of activism and seeking to find or build community within a creative practice? in the context of an all-encompassing attention uh, economy. So I guess that's about how to be an activist and artist writer within like a precarious sort of precarity. Does anyone wanna um, take that one on first or? Andrew, if I, you wrote, uh, you, you spoke about the access to the oxygen of publicity. Do you have any advice for anyone finding a community who doesn't have um, access to that oxygen. Well, I'm, I'm not a social media person um, for all sorts of reasons, but I feel that uh, that is less an issue now because of social media than perhaps it used to be. I mean, everyone, <laughs> everyone has access to the oxygen of publicity. They're, they're different. I mean, I think there are different levels of hierarchy of attention, obviously within 
the attention economy, but the, you know, the centrality of, uh, you know, mainstream high profile uh, media outlet um, is, is no longer quite so pronounced as it, as it used to be. Because people, people are obviously paying attention and being influenced by a whole, you know, variety of, of media sources. Um, uh, and uh, while that has made, you know, organizing a little more difficult in some respects, because everyone is fighting for, you know, the attention of a relatively small segment of the population that is open <laughs> to being influenced. <laughs> Um, and I often feel it's smaller than we believe. Um, at the same time, it, it, it has opened up, uh, you know, access well, well beyond the traditional gatekeepers. So there, you know, this is a, I think this is a familiar problem. It's a familiar topic for, for folks who, you know, address social media, the upsides and the downsides. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we take it in our stride. I would say, however, just to, reinforce you know what i said earlier about social media displacing um the 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 virtues of face-to-face -face organizing which to some degree it has done there really is no substitute for um you know getting to know people in the flesh is that because that's how you establish trust ultimately it's much more difficult to establish trust online um, between folks you want to work and organize with, you do it in the flesh, and um, and also practice mutual aid. It's much more easy to do that when your when your life is continuous with uh, between meetings and, and 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 the other parts of your obligations. I don't know if that helps. That's my view. <laughs> and then I think that's one one final question um, from Sonia Moore. Oh, and then there's another, <laughs> another one after that. Um, it seems to me that writers often become aware that words are political and powerful through an early experience when words um, save the speaker or writer's skin, for example, enabling them to transform a situation to their advantage. So essentially a selfish experience. Uh, is this so for the panelists? If so, then at what point did altruism come into play? and has writing lived up to its promise for them? Are there pop-out moments where the panelists felt that they had proof of change made in the world as a result of their activism? And thanks to the power, power of their words. So I guess this is a two-part question of, um, did activism originally start as a kind of having power in the world? Did it become about altruism and then have you seen a, an effect of your writing activism is that does any um chloe as a writer activist <laughs> but again it's i guess i'm just coming from a different place so with uh, with fiction is it with my you know so far i think all my novels one of the main themes is urban alienation and and well and disenchantment but um but urban um urban alienation but i can't i wouldn't say i consider it sort of activism and again um the crossover with um with animal rights and the and the climate emergency and that it it's only become slightly more tangible and visible recently but um, so I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that question because I wouldn't consider my novels on any conscious level apart from, you know, again, bringing in, um, so these urban ecosystems where I feel every species should be taken into account and respected and considered, but, you know, sort of slipping that in in very subtle ways, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd call that activism, so. Maybe Astra, or well, one of the three of you, could, maybe one of you would be better suited for answering that question. I mean, I don't, it, it's an interesting, I, I don't quite relate to the question, I have to be honest. I mean, I think, why did I want to write? I just love books. Like, I'm just one of those people I wanted to write because I wanted to 
be involved in these things. I also didn't go to school. I had no friends, as I said earlier. So books were my friends. Um, <laughs> altruism is a word also is something I think I kind of am a, I don't like so much. I don't feel like altruism, that kind of selflessness, solidarity, when what Andrew said about solidarity, being in relationship speaks to me more. Um, I don't know, writing, it's like a chant. It's a way to feel like you're productively channeling your rage <laughs> and frustration. Along with curiosity and all those other nice things I talked about, you know. We're actually, Juxta, we're, we're publishing a really wonderful short piece by, by Sonia on positions next month. She's a, she's a really wonderful writer. Um, so the next but, question. But Astra, could I, could I just add um, to, I, I, I agree with what Astra said, although I do believe that uh, a, a lot of it is about the question of timing and good timing. Because uh, we, we, you know, we, we can, we, we do a lot of action, we do a lot of writing, we do a lot of organizing, and we see that it doesn't, it doesn't always have the immediate impact because it's, it's not the right time. Um, but it, it often becomes the right time. And when, you know, I think about some of the, a lot of the strands of Occupy, for example, which have come to, you know, generate some wins along the way. I mean, the, the debt resistance movement is, is, is the one we, we, we're most familiar with, of course. We were on the political margins 10 years ago, complete outliers, <laughs> uh, left field outliers, and, and now are the, the, the center of uh, mainstream you know, political action. Likewise, with uh, you know, the work I do with Decolonize This Place, uh, when we started up, we were very much on, on, on the margins, it's sort of small art world niche, but uh, cultural, you know, decolonial work now is very, is, is, is very central. And, um, you know, the, uh, the, the George Floyd protests, I think, were also a, a good example of uh, these, they, they happened very spontaneously in a way, but obviously they've been prepared for by an immense amount of organizing and writing over the years. And they broke out at a time which was, you know, the least propitious time when we were under lockdown. People were told to stay at home and yet hundreds and thousands of people went out in the streets and, uh, and, and, and produced this moment, which really, uh, uh, I, I, I think, led to a racial reckoning, which, which had been deferred so many times. Obviously, it's incomplete, but, uh, um, I, I, and, and I do think we have to, we have to acknowledge these wins. It's, it's like a positive version of that Chinese proverb, you know, that if you, if you sit by the river for long enough, you see the bodies of your enemies float by. <laughs> I think, I think that's a negative version of, of what I was uh, describing, <laughs> but still an evocative one, I hope. <laughs> well, just to add to that, I woke up this morning to a bunch of, I wouldn't say friendly emails, but kind of, you know, grumpy from strangers telling me that, uh, you know, I shouldn't just be working on canceling student debt. I should be working on canceling medical debt and canceling rent and canceling mortgages. And it was like, wow, okay, I'm being yelled at by strangers. But they're literally saying what we've been saying for 10 years. And Andrew's right. I mean, we were shouting in the wilderness, regarded as just totally abject and ridiculous. And now we have, you know, so I think a great success is actually when your words are echoed back at you by people you, you actually, these aren't people I think are my enemies, these are regular people, but by politicians, people in power um, who are forced to say the phrases that we were shouting in a park 10 years ago. Long, long day. Um, and the next question is, is, is for Astra from, from Tara. I loved hearing you talk about how organizing is primarily reactive, whereas writing is more contemplative. Are there any writers you feel who do a good job of encompassing some of that reactive energy in their writing? Yeah, I don't know. it makes me think actually, I'm, you know, I grew up reading The Baffler, which is an independent magazine in the US. Um, where one of their phrases was they drink the haterade, not the Gatorade. So I think of that as a publication that has that kind of writing. It's a kind of um, reactive political writing I tried to do. I, I mean, I think a lot of people do it. A lot of people write reactively and angrily. Um, I think someone who is doing, I would love to hear what other people say. Um, 
you know, someone who's doing it in like the best possible way right now is Kianga Yamada Taylor, who's doing amazing pieces for the New Yorker, speaking to this political moment. Um, I don't know. I'm curious what other what other folks, but the Bafflers of Publication comes to my mind, and it was very influential for me, even as I've ultimately, when I find my voice, just like Andrew was talking about finding his voice, the voice he's comfortable with. I think the voice I feel most authentic about is actually has more space in it <laughs> and tries to slow down a bit. But I actually, I do really enjoy a good angry tirade. <laughs> and then here's one from Josh. Um, maybe more applicable to young writers and creators in today's economy. How can you reconcile your day job, the one that pays your rent, with your creative outlet and activism, uh, particularly when you may find yourself working for an organization or industry, your activism directly attacks. Well, one of our, I mean, I'm just thinking of uh, Petra Kelly when she was a member of parliament, she would also protest outside, even when she was a member. And so she had her sort of her seat within the building, but outside too. Um, but for instance, now one of our main campaigns um, leading up to COP in November, if it's not delayed again, um, is about recycled paper, because apparently, even if it says that um, in the inside of books that, um, I can't remember the, something about sustainable recycled paper, but something very, a, a, a dismal percentage actually is. So one of our main campaigns this year, so, you know, we want to ask high profile writers whether they'll write to the, write public letters to their publisher and say, um, I'll only do my next book with you if you'll print it on 100% recycled paper. And we're thinking, well, how many writers, you have to be in a very comfortable and confident position probably with your publisher house to be able to ask that of them. And again, um, there's been a lot of hesitation as to who would actually be bold enough and confident enough of their position to um, demand something of of, uh, of their employer and. Yeah. I can say something about speaking up within a university setting, just to continue what Gigi was saying, because you would think that uh, you know being a tenured academic in a university does actually protect you in all sorts of ways. I mean, it protects your academic freedom. You can be fired as you, as you can in most American workplaces because we have an at-will employment culture here. Uh, you can be fired for, for speaking, speaking your, um, your opinions and especially if they're critical of university policy itself. It's, uh, it, it's alarming how few academics actually do that <laughs> once they have tenure. Um, always a source of uh, uh, anguish to me, but I've gotten used to it. You know, how few of my colleagues actually take advantage of that. Uh, I won't call it privilege because I think it's, it's, a, it's a right, it's a speech right that everyone should enjoy. Um, but it's there for academics and, and, and there's so many, uh, I, I have so many colleagues who are Marxists in the classroom and uh, that's as far as it goes. I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't cross the road for the movement. And, uh, and when it comes to speaking up on issues of academic policy or uh, adjacent areas, you can't rely on them. So uh, even, you know, even in a setting like that, uh, there's, there's, there's always a, a very small minority of folks you can rely on and um, and expect solidarity from on, on a whole range of issues. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I can imagine it not being not being easy working for an organisation that contradicts your activism. So that was a really nice question. Um, and then there's a question from Flavia for Astra Taylor. Um, I was thinking about the abstraction that you bring in your images without overusing cliches, for example, about crowds. But I was thinking how difficult um, it would be to write and create images like that. 
so so abstract and how is that related with your activism so i think that's about how yeah yeah how your filmmaking avoids cl uh, cliched images yeah i think it's something so what is democracy doesn't have some very conspicuous images it doesn't show the white house it doesn't show people voting right so part of how you make images fresh i think is by avoiding certain cliches um and there are these cliche Im images we associate you know with people power people with their raised fists and these things um so it's it's part of I guess a process of challenging oneself to try to imagine things anew, <laughs> right? To think beyond these cliches and these inherited tropes. Um, and so I think in that sense, it is related to the organizing. One thing I love about the debt resistance projects that Andrew and I have been involved in is we're trying to build on traditions. So we're not rejecting <laughs> the history of, of economic power building or it's present, right? So we take, we take um, inspiration from the labor movement. We, we value the labor movement. We say, wow, workers organizing against the boss, not just for better wages, for benefits, but for autonomy, for control, for, for, um, for voice in the workplace. What, can, what else can we do that? How can we receive that and revision that <laughs> it, it, to address all of these people who in the United States are never gonna get a chance to join a labor union? for all sorts of reasons, right? We're all in the economy, whether we're students, whether we're unemployed or part-time workers or retired. So why shouldn't we have other forms of, you know, economic association? And so it's that, it's that, it's, it's all imaginative work. It's all trying to um, take these bits of inspiration and put them in some, some new way. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I love this question. I mean, I feel like, you know, for me, I'm starting to imagine this new essay film that is why I want to break away a little bit from organizing. And it speaks a lot to what Chloe's seeing about the non, the non-human world and our contract with urban animals. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, part of being a writer or an artist or an activist is just trying to get people to see things differently and to imagine that things could be different. We could live in a totally different world. It's possible. The world was different in the past. It will be different in the future. So we're all, always trying to shift perspective and that's why cliches are bad. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of, um, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry for this already, Andrew, but you, you quote in your book, I think a motto that's on the side of Scottish, Scottish Parliament that says something like live now as if you're in <laughs> uh, it's live as if you were in the first day of a new nation. That's it. Yeah, that's what I write, which is uh, such a beautiful. Yeah, Alistair Gray, the Glasgow novelist, attributed mm. to him. Yeah. Um, I guess if, if those are all the questions, then we might, we might come to the end of how to be an activist and a writer. <laughs> I hope that I'm also speaking for everyone who joined, right? So I had a really good time and all the answers were just so interesting. And um, yeah, I'm gonna go away and so much to look up and so much to learn. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Andrew. Thank you, Octavia. Thank you, Octavia. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, Andrew. Oh. <laughs> I didn't get to say how much I've learned from you and you've been a real role model for me as the writer oh, activist. That's so, so sweet. Wanna... Put that Thank on the record you. because it's true. <laughs> yeah, that's so sweet. <laughs> Vice versa. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Ciao, ciao.